hope you'll uh, sit back and enjoy some of these. Uh, Anne was nice in explaining some of the things in my life, but I really do enjoy ICL, and I'm glad to go through it today. The poem that uh, my junior high teacher forced on me <laughs> was, was trees. And I shall never see a, a tree. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her arfy, leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. So that sort of haunted me for years, but I really never did anything with it. And I have a little ditty here. I thought maybe Lois Rosen and Franca would be interested in. Poetry now. Poetry now, it's all around us. It surrounds us. It's personal. It's literal. How about that rap about this and that? Even advertising is using it. Athletics, politics, it fits. Poetry is everywhere. T-shirts, underwear, on and on. Lake Wobegon. <laughs> and uh, everybody asks me if I've been uh, published. And uh, I sort of hedge about that. Some years back, the uh, local paper had uh, this notice in here from the National Library of Poetry from Maryland. And they said if you would submit a poem, 20 lines or less, they would put it in this anthology and have this big book with hundreds of different people. So I presented this poem. Fall is in the air. Do you hear the call of the lonesome train? It's out of my youth and here again. Do you see the mist upon the tree lifting its head as if to see? Do you smell the smoke of the fall pyre? Leaves and bark reach up as a funeral pyre. Do you feel the wind upon your face? It makes you know you've won the race. Do you taste the apple on your lips? The juice will run clear down to your hips. Do you feel the peace of fall in the air with its sense of beauty, exuberance, like a county fair? And they wrote on this thing back and said it's a wonderful verse, and they're selecting it for the sound of poetry. <laughs> Then they said, well, if you will send us $39.95, you can read your poem. <laughs> so I said, uh, goodbye. <laughs> and uh, Peter Byman uh, enjoyed one of my poems, and he says, uh, I know you gave it before, but he says it's quite a while ago, and uh, people won't even remember. <laughs> And I'm sure you won't. But here's my chicken soup. Did you ever try to walk down the street with a fighting cock under each arm? These roosters came from a New Orleans farm. This black guy sold them to me, but not to eat. You can't tip your hat, shake hands, or be discreet. You can't put one down, it would fight the one in your arm. Did you ever try to walk down the street with a fighting cock under each arm? With 
high hat and walking stick on Basin Street, shiny shoes added to the general alarm. I wasn't trying to cause people harm, but some of those dudes wanted a sheet scoot, and whoever tried to walk down the street with a fighting cock under each arm. And I don't know, is Peter here? <laughs> um, one of my newer poems had to do with uh, driving across the railroad tracks here the other day, and I had to sit and wait for the train to go by. And this one came to me. As a freight crane goes clicking by, there are no cabooses. Where did they go? <laughs> the red lights have changed. Where did they go? Only on the boxcars now to tell the train's end. Only the whistle is here again. There are no cabooses. Where did they go? Ah, I just spied one over on the Willamette Heritage Center. The number 507 is all wrapped up in blue and white, ready to be made new again. And I gave them a copy of this over there, and I don't know what they'll ever do with it, but they have it. <laughs> uh, she has up here that uh, I had my second knee replaced, and uh, I had an appointment for my surgeon, and I was a little bit shaken up. I wasn't sure just what was going to happen. So I guess I was a little bit wakeful. So 333, thinking about my knee, to feel the sand upon my knees, to pray to God upon these knees. To feel the sand upon my knees, to taste the salt of the sea breeze. To feel the sand upon my knees, to hear the roar of the clouds above. To feel the sand upon my knees, to even smell the kelp along the shore. To feel the sand upon my knees, to love the zeal of the air to feel the sand upon my knees, those little toes just wiggle and shake just below the sand on my knees. And I can give my honey a squeeze. Now don't you wish you had sand on your knees? <laughs> and then I even put a PS on there. I said, uh, of course I have other ideas about my knees, about Dr. Zersky and Courtney and the physical therapy. So I might write some more about that sometime. <laughs> and this is a fairly long one. I hope Carol and George Muller will appreciate it. I call it tripping with ICL, and I don't mean falling over. <laughs> the new mown hay is stacked in squared rows along straight lines for weeks, months, who knows? Clouds rise high above the cascades. Off to the east is striking sunlight. Then continue north and south as they fade. The hills to the west, so near and clear, show trees and farmland dotted with homes so dear. What a surprise, a loaded log truck goes by north on the interstate, a highway heavyweight, reminding me of Coos County as a younger guy. Won't you come with me through the rocks and trees following the Columbia River Gorge? Feast your eyes from side to side, Monoma Falls, Crown Point, Beacon Rock, Salilo, where you watch for teepees. See ancient volcanoes forged by heat and pressure and great dams that fill the river's throat and spillways. The green of the trees, the blue of the water, the orchards with their tall, narrow windbreaks appear as an amphitheater. The river turns darker as clouds move by 
accelerated by white caps. The mountains reveal lightning and thunderclaps, while loads of par barges move up and down the river, towed and pushed by mother tugs. Moving from west to east, we lose the old growth trees of green, but gain the fields of bearded wheat and golden grain. Behold, texture of velveteen. Even the colors along the rim change from bright to dim. Purples, dark green, contrasted by bright gold and tan, as humpback hills across the way seem to move in the wind as a caravan leaves fluttering like Colorado as aspirin. aspirin. The sun is again on the river, with surfers racing across without fear. They race at speeds up to 45, just a jumble of coming and going. Look out, a jibe. Looking up the high bluffs of the gorge, you can just imagine the old days with Indians ready to charge the wagons. These palisades of the Columbia will be with us long after the century passes. While wind and rain, sun and snow, only chase giants grain out of the time. So just look how long it take, takes to cut these mighty crevasses. Oh, let me not forget the reason for our trip, to see the Mary Hill Museum, perched on the rim slip with her gowns, paintings, statue work, with her gardens, peacocks, and stonework, with her chess sets, Indian artifacts, and replica of stone hinge laid out like a clockwork. But there is a loneliness here that work drives Sam Hill over the hill, a precipice, with all his great vision of road building skills the loss of his wife and family, love, may have been his nemesis. All in all, the day to remember, sounds, sights, food all right and friends together. Thank you, thank you for the day, the driver, the host, and oh yes, the castle's ghosts. So that was quite a trip we took. And I got a little romantic one here, uh, came across. <laughs> Stand beside me in the rain. Let it drip and run inside me. This tender feeling has no pain. The splendor of the night will remain. The wind sweeps in, choking the drains. It lights up the sky with streaks of light. Thunder and lightning add to the drama. Clothes soaked clear down to our toes. Who cares should flu intrude? A night like this only happens once and only with your true love. Dawn breaks, the charm is gone. All that remains are droplets on the lawn, showing off God's delight. So as she pours feeling into me with her arms on my head. So anyway, there she was. Uh, I live at the Springs, which is a 80-person uh, facility. It's uh, independent living. And uh, they put out a monthly newsletter, and they, they threw in one of my poems one day. The Great Northwest. Have you seen the clouds hug the hills? Have you seen the clouds nuzzle the mountain? They sit on top, they rest in hollows, they cover the sky, they drift on by. They move, oh, where have they been? They surround and close you in. It's quiet under their blanket. It's spooky how they've crept. Lose yourself in gray on gray and dream on Discovery Bay. As you move on home, the sky opens up in front of you. 
The mist is replaced by stifling rain, the rain that beats hard on the ground, rain that stings right through the glass, rain that refreshes the grass, rain that comes out of the clouds and clouds that come like shrouds. The hills are sung by lightning. It's beautiful. It's frightening. And we had uh, some years back a uh, wonderful Indian lady uh, from the local reservation who came and talked to us about storytelling and uh, the Indians and stuff. And that sort of got me, so I came out with this. Can you tell a story? Not any story. Can you tell a story? Not any story. I mean one that will hold the listener's attention. One with a punch, a point, a kick. One that thrills, spills, and instills. One that has a hook. Indian storytellers favor stories woven around coyote, bear, fox, wolf, rabbit, and raven, smudged with sweet grasses. Usually, coyote is the cunning trickster, pulls the other forest animals into these human traits of greed, selfishness, shame, and arrogance. These animals all wind up with human voices, even the stars, the trees, the birds, and personalities, smudged with sweet grass. The only weapon is the speech, singing bones. So, and I used to live in a uh, duplex, and the only color flower in the backyard was a little old climbing rose, it wasn't much. But anyway, I wrote this about remembering it. Dew is on the bud, neat and tight, with its green five-pointed cover parted to the light. It looks so tender, rolled up and cozy bright. It's only a red climber and it's red delight. But as it opens, it has crazy design as it sits up on its stem-like spine. And if you're lucky to pick it right, it will have a green leaf backdrop the rest of its life. However, some of mine that come off the vine seem to be alone, just stem and flower, with a smell that makes you moan. As, your rose, as the rose matures, the pleasure is yours. The warm fragrance will linger and give you full measure. The red velvet, when held to your cheek, gives off a gentle softness that makes you weak. Now stop and think, if you're about at the brink of throwing the rose away, instead, keep it for another day. Press it, press it close to you, press it in a book to use. Have I got anybody asleep yet? <laughs> Maybe I ought to read my uh, poem about the beauty of gray. This is so neat. I sort of fell in love with Wallace Long and his choir, and I uh, got a scholarship started in his name. And he was young enough that uh, people came to me and said, did he die? <laughs> Is he retiring? I says, no, I just like the guy and I think he's doing a good job. So we got this con scholarship going and it's producing now pretty well. But you could always give him some money for that. The Beauty of Gray, he was so kind to me that uh, he found a young college graduate who wrote music. And so I gave him three or four poems and he chose this one to have this guy put it to music. And they performed it last, a year ago, April. The Beauty of Gray, out where earth meets sky, where wind sends kites high, where waves ceaseless roll, 
nature takes her toll. The kite hovers, dips, and dives, just like the seabird thrives. The mist surrounds the headlands, clamoring, rising inland. The gray of the clouds, repeated in the sea, the sand a different tone. God, just you and me. Trees, too, in their green gray, have hands lifted as if to pray, nor friendly noise intrude, seated here in solitude. I was at a uh, church retreat down at Agate Beach, and I went down to the, the shore to run that by. Anyway, uh, they made a big fuss about it, and they uh, made me come up on the stage and gave me some flowers and uh, all that good stuff. A few years back, uh, I went to hear uh, a poetry reading by James D. D. Priest the Portland Symphony director. And it must have been the day that uh, the clocks changed because I got there a whole hour early. <laughs> and what the heck are you going to do? So I sat in my car and I found this old flat little old paper bag and I started writing a poem on that. And by the way, if you're gonna write a poem, have something that you're gonna write on. I even wrote on a uh, deck of cards that I got an airplane when they used to give us little things. When I went to Mexico, I wrote a poem on, <laughs> on this deck of cards. Anyway, is there poetry in music? Of course you say. Is there music in poetry? And again, of course. Let me ask you this, is there poetry in the conductor, in the swirl of the baton? How about the crescendo or the plex staccato? Now I say, rather than ask, there is poetry in the sway of the violins, the attack of the bows of the strings. And have you noticed the half turn and lower torso of the cello section? as one together, but each separate. And the way the percussion people move from gong to drums and gong, the way this may not be poetry, but could we live without it? I tell you, there is poetry in the coattails of James D. Priest, spins from deep brass to the soft violins and back to the other side, to the solid cellos. Oh, what I could capture in rhythm and sweet, sweet piece of wind, bravado, a hyphen ending on paper such as this. I don't want to be too late. Um, all of us are old enough that uh, when we talk to people, we can say, oh, I remember that. <laughs> so I have this one about remembering. Let us not forget God's love for us. Let us not forget those in need. Let us not forget our friends with love, remembering, remembering. You can honor a loved one most by remembering things he or she said or did. You can honor a dear friend best by remembering sweet things from the past. Why do you think they sell so many cards thinking of you if it weren't for remembering? For it's remembering the little things that count. I took another trip <laughs> on the old stern wheeler down by the riverfront. I, I never had much faith in that. They kept getting stuck on the sandbar or <laughs> running out of gas and all. all. 
But I took a ride on the river today, here on the 14th of May. The rain was quite heavy this AM morn, but by 10 o'clock, it was just the light spray. I took a ride on the river today, down to the dock and the gangway. There stood the prize of the day, a flat hull, two-story, did rise, but staring my eyes along the since the days. To stand at the bow, the drip off the roof, to stand at the stern where the drip was drip proof. Watching the twins paddle wheels progress to turn the boat, one full power, the other one at powerless. I took a ride on the river today, the River Queen, now the gone by days. The kids were interested in all new things, and there was a whole lot of bravo and new. We took a turn by the new bridge and Brown Island, sort of at the end of the grassland. As we turned to slide down the river, we went by three bridges with logs hidden high. We didn't go north through the middle channel. We, he chose the starboard side of the vessel. Didn't mind the brush and the trees, but the apartments in the condos didn't please. All in all, the children were well behaved. I showed one girl a trap door that she was standing on. She just had to pull the catch to know, just to see the water below. But the door did not not open and no water was below. I took a ride on the river today. Don't you wish you were on the river today? All the kids took a turn at the wheel. They could feel the vibration of the motor below. We didn't lose power today, nor did we get stranded on the sandbar at all. And I'm afraid I have to go back to my uh, grandson. He was, uh, I don't know, four or five. Anyway, I had this little pickup. And he called it Grumpy's Cruck. <laughs> Grumpy's Cruck does a lot of things. Though you can't sit on its springs, Grumpy's truck is great to sit on, in the bed, on the bed, or even stand on your head. It's sort of light green and sort of bounces along. It's sort of serene and scares my mom. If you, it was small as I am, you can live in the bed as well, but the rest part of all is to lift up tall and be placed in your grumpy's crook, for there you're out of the muck. <laughs> the tailgate can be lifted down and you just sort of sit around with your legs dangling and your feet swinging and listen to the words of your dad and grumps that talk about the road that bumps. We won't find any new ones now, for they seem to be hugging the ground they're called Nissan now. They take off anywhere. They're hard sides. They're four by four, never a care. But the crook that I remember was small and clean, would bounce along just a song, not hard and mean, just right for gramps, just right for me. Know what I mean? And I didn't get much follow up from him on that. <laughs> I don't know why. The first of May this year, the mountains are calling, the streams are flowing, the trees are sending out their marvelous fragrance. The spring is here with magical time of year. Gardens have color, bursting in every bud and leaf. The birds will be with us soon, but for now, we will have to watch for them to fly and dart across the sky. The sun will warm us, the moon 
will trail across the sky. It's great to be alive. I must have been happy that day. <laughs> and one of the uh, classes I took at Chemeketa published a little work that we all did. And we had uh, two people talk to us about dogs earlier last week. And so I'm going to read you a story about my little dog, Brandy. I have a little dog, and he pleases me. He doesn't eat much, and that pleases me. <laughs> he's high-centered, and he's got fuzzy hair. He's hard of hearing, and he sort of stares. He's proud of his tail and holds it in the air, licks himself clean like he gives a care. When the lady that clipped him had to tell her, like a lamb, for he's a poodle, you know, not a French fam, told her I'm the one that takes him out and she better not make him frilly and stand out. <laughs> Can't leave him in the car when it's hot, you know, and I wouldn't either if there's freezing snow. His papers say he's an apricot brandy and I think much of him, he's just a dandy. When we go for a walk, we're an ideal pair. He has his at a golf ball and a bone here and there. He doesn't bark like so many poodles do. He doesn't bother cats, and they don't bother him, too. But one day, this cat landed right on his back. It happened so fast, just like that. And as he came right off of the ground, I didn't think I'd find him till he called the pound. I'm sure you'd like him, and that pleases me. He's older than me, and that doesn't displease me. He lost his former master and mourned him so. The lady that had him had to let him go. He bonded to me and I bonded to him. I don't know what I'll do when I lose him. But for now, we're buddies and that pleases me. And if you could see him wiggle and smile, it would please thee. <laughs> and another... Uh, object of our Chemeketa Community College classes, we were to uh, put down an object that we were going to write about and write as many ideas of it on the paper. I fill three pages. <laughs> so you're going to be stuck listening to my three pages. Look up. Look up into the sky. Towering clouds up in the sky, tantum clouds racing by, those water vapor droplets suspended like baby blankets. Cotton candy atmosphere reflected many times like a tiny mirror. White castles in the air, old men in robes and white hair. Beams of light that come out of the clouds, shining down as fingers of God, as if driven apart by snow plows, to see these clouds tipped with gold. Clouds rolling, percolating, churning, leave trails of turbulent and colliding. Some corduroy, corduroy limpish and dimpled, others squat, blimped, and quietly quilted. Some you'd like to reach like vanilla candy, others scanty, silky, lacy, under canopy. How can they climb and build and pause short unfulfilled? Like ladies working in puffs of cotton, wisps, plumes, feathery witches' cauldron, sewing tiered trousseaux, pleated ribbon, ermine, lambskin, Drape that mannequin. Clouds merge and move away, iridescent, showing in the strange way. Clouds gather or are torn apart, the eye of the storm, a pivotal heart. Clouds moving by, nimbus, stratus, dancing across the sky, cumulus, cirrus, finish. So, anyway, uh, 
we got that put together. <laughs> I went up to uh, Washington last weekend. Uh, my son and daughter-in-law drove me up, and we got up near St. Helens, and that reminded me of a, a little thing I wrote some years ago. Mount St. Helens, a year later, here on the mountain of destruction is its life, its life, surprise, vegetation, lahar, bathed in the warmth of the sun, fanned by the breath of the wind, lahar, cooled by the shadows of the trees, warmed by the love of good friends. The Lord walks in quiet of life. The Lord sings in the songs of the birds. Oh, what a glorious day here in the month of May on St. Helens, not so far away. And oh my, another trip with ICL. <laughs> I must enjoy going out of town. Anyway, we went up to the uh, Japanese gardens, and uh, we had a great time up there. And so I wrote a haiku. Cloud-covered sky, harmony, tranquility, Japanese gardens. And then I wrote a tonka, which is a, a haiku with a seven and five more lines. Five-pointed pagoda, gardens of sand, stone trees, ponds, streams, waterfalls, serene quiet, beauty here, rest and reflection. But I like the one I <laughs> did on a, just a four-line poem. Sand raked as a rolling sea, stones placed as a family. Water plays as a symphony. Quiet brings one tranquility. And I uh, gave a copy of this to the director of the, the garden, and uh, he liked it, and he said, I have it on here on my desk where I can read it all the time. So I thought that was a, a nice comment from him. And I have sort of a serious piece here. The children, the children, they will survive. They are strong. They are resilient. They are the world's future. They make a game of war. Some cry, some die. They may be weak at times and strong the next. They will cheat, lie, and steal, but loyalty can be their aim. They are camp followers, soldiers at 10. Please remember them, South Africa, Somalia, Sudan, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Bosnia, Vietnam, Mexico, Haiti, Niger, Syria, Nigeria, and yes, the United States. This is man's legacy blown by the winds of war. And I hope we do remember the children. I never felt so high. The beauty sublime chases all the time over the skyline, up a timber line. The sky is threefold, ghost stories unfold, as natives, I'm told, whether warm or cold. The clouds to the east, black and ominous, with lightning and all. The clouds to the south, a half moon on top, not near as tall. The clouds to the west, purple, pink, gray and peach, most beautiful of all. The clouds at our feet over the slopes, they all enthrall. Some move as a river, 
some nestle as a cover. They just seem to purr in, others sort of sleep in. Maybe said to creep in, but they all have you a grinning. The bright red fireball, fireball that seems through the trees is setting now, but it's sure to please. It helps to have someone with you on days like this, someone special to share the day, the evening, the memory. I didn't think I'd ever run out of this stuff. I thought you guys would all be asleep. Uh, part of my uh, being the MC at the uh, Sunday school uh, and these poems that I sort of worked on. So uh, at the end, I wrote this little piece. I just delight to read a poem to shed some light and then go home. You don't know how it frees my soul to have someone enjoy the words I told. And that came out of my mouth on any given day, for really I don't have much to say, but it's the meaning that poems portray. Thank you all, the doubters too, for without them, I'd not have you. I think I might have passed up one here that I can go back and retrieve. Uh, I wanted to make sure I took my full time. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate you guys listening to me and, and I hope you'll go over to the uh, Heritage Center and see the old caboose sitting over there. They got a blue tarp on it now. The, the white one's gone, and I, they're working on it. I think Dave and some of his buddies are, are working on it. And I don't wish any of you to have to have sand on your knees when you have an operation. Well, maybe I've... Uh, run out of some of this stuff. You'd probably be glad of that. Wes, would you like, would you like some questions? Okay, we'll try that. You have time for that? I didn't think I'd have time for that. Well, we do, we do. I, I think a bunch of us have questions or comments. Yeah. Is that okay? Oh, there are some left, huh? <laughs> Wes, this is Ken. Since I have the mic, I might as well start out here. I liked your poem about the disappearance of the caboose. My dad worked on the railroad for many years, and of course the railroads made that decision to save money, but it wasn't very popular with the employees because many of them were laid off. So they named that light that they put on the back of the train now in place of the caboose, Fred. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the F stands for, but the rest was rear end device. Well, I, oh, here's a question. I'll, I'll. So, in regard to the blue tarp over the cupola, is because the windows are being rebuilt, so we don't want the rain to get in, but the that's what's happening there. <laughs> um, I have a question while Ken's taking it down to Jim. Wes, it's over here, over to your right, in the blue sweater, me. <laughs> do you ever wake up in the night with poetry, or do, is that a daytime thing for you? Do, I know composers who have to wake up and they, they scribble stuff on their bedstand. Do you have that happen to you? Well, quite a few I get early in the morning, I don't know why, they just get to me, I got to get up and write them down before I forget them. <laughs> That's cool, but nothing wakes you up at one o'clock in the morning, maybe. 
You don't you don't find yourself awake at one o'clock, waked up by some idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So when you were telling us about um, seeing Mount Saint Helen a year after um, the explosion, um, I gather you were talking about the new growth there, but and you were using the, the word lahar, and I don't know what that means. Is that the name of the plant? Well, it was. Uh, carved into some of the wood pieces as you walk along the path out at St. Helens. And uh, it has a meaning, but I'm not sure what it is. Well, here we have um, electronically received this. <laughs> Lahars are mud flows that contain at least 60% volcanic material. And they originate high on a volcanic edifice. And it goes Great. on. But thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, and some of the people that helped me over the years, I, I used to, when we were downstairs in Smullen, we didn't have a mic and all this stuff. And so uh, our classes were like two hours. Well, heck, I didn't have enough poems to do that. So I had four or five different pro, uh, sessions that I did poetry down there. And of course, I had help, and I had such distinguished people as uh, Sandy Colburn and John Ziegler and good old Stan Tepper and Donna Moran and Ernie Williams that just passed away, Ray Heller and Harold Murray who used to run the programs for us. You might remember him and Margaret and Hans van der Weyden and Jean Hoxie, who uh, used to write to the newspaper, to the editorial, maybe once a week or more, all about Fairview Hospital and stuff. But he was one of those that uh, read and helped me cover the two, uh, two hours we were on. Over here on this side. Excuse me. Uh, I wanted to ask you with your uh, initial poem about the tree that I think you inspired inspired you. Was that a Robert Frost? Did Robert Frost write the poem? Yeah. Oh, Joyce Kilmer. Joyce Kilmer. I was yeah. trying to remember who I remember reading that many years ago. Wes, uh, it's Tony here. Thank you very much. This was wonderful for you to share your work with us. And I wonder, just before you conclude today, if you would read the poem Gray again, one more time. What poem? Gray. Oh, yeah, Gray. Thank you. Sure. I gotta find it first. <laughs> the beauty of gray, out where earth meets sky, where wind sends kites high, where waves ceaseless roll, nature takes her toll. The kite hovers dips and dives, just like the seabird thrives. The mist surrounds the headlands, clamoring, rising, inland. The gray of the clouds, repeated in the sea, the sand a different tone, God, just you and me. The trees, too, in their green gray, have hands lifted as if to pray, nor friendly noise intrude, seated here in solitude. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much for sharing that, and apologies for the burst of Vivaldi in the middle of it. <laughs> I should have saved that for the end. I think you would enjoy looking at these pictures behind you that you may not even have seen. Dave, can you turn around and look? Oh. 
Oh, yeah, that's when I had a talk. <laughs> After I, they introduced me when I wrote the, the poem. And there's the, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you had that. Like I say, they gave me a, a poem written and a bouquet. And there's Dr. Long. That's it. We go see his uh, jazz in the back end of Hudson Hall almost every term. That's do, it. You, do you know the name of the, the person who wrote the music, Wes? Pardon? What was the name of the person who wrote the music to your poem? Oh, boy. Uh, I, I don't mean to hold things up. Yeah, he was, he was up there on the stage at one, yeah. one, one of those pictures. Mm -hmm. I didn't reckon. I, I didn't know if it was the, the man to your right. Yeah, an alumni, but I didn't, obviously not a recent one. Yeah. Yeah. There he is right there on the right. This guy. Yeah. Zach name. Davis, I've just yeah. been told. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. They even got a car. Ten minute break. Thank you.